So let me begin. Um, my name is Yo. I'm here to present um, kind of my work around thick mapping. This is my opening slide. And uh, this kind of blurry image in the background is something I took from inside the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And I'll talk a little bit about more about my journey into the nuclear power plant. And this kind of little bar at the bottom represents kind of my life in GIS, shall we say. I, I, I began my career um, before the turn of the century and it, and it spans almost a 25 year kind of engagement with GIS. And I've had many phases uh, of my life as a GIS uh, practitioner. And I'm just gonna touch upon a few of those that I think are relevant for this um, panel here. Um, I'm currently an associate professor at Beitaku University in Japan. Uh, life happens. Uh, I thought I would be at UCLA for the rest of my life and retire there. But uh, I find myself in Japan in, in, and I live in Kyoto and I actually travel all over the country and I teach uh, in Japan for the first time in my life. It's, it's a fascinating journey as well. Um, I want to start actually with a historical map since we're in Japan. I want to introduce you to a historical map of Japan. This is a map that was created and commissioned by the fifth shogunate, Tsunayoshi, in 1696. And um, I call it a multi-directional map. It kind of debunks our current understanding of maps and geography. And let me see if I can do this. I actually have it on a different platform that some of you may be familiar with. Let me try to bring that up. There we go. So um, welcome to Google Earth. Uh, not many people use Google Earth anymore. But uh, when we started thick mapping at UCLA, we used Google Earth heavily because it has a lot of kind of ways of navigating space and time that kind of actual modern day uh, geographic tools lack. And we really love Google Earth because it, you know, it allows us to kind of move in 3D space. It allows us to tilt the map, but also with a map, a historical map like this one, which is multi-directional, it allows us to watch and view this map from different angles, right? It doesn't prioritize north or south or east or west. You're actually supposed to move around, walk around this map, and try to understand it from different perspectives. And um, the writings on this map reflect that. This is a huge map. It's about a few meters on each side. So our kind of speculation about how people would view this map is that they would walk around the map, lay it down on the floor and walk around it, and then try to understand what's happening in their uh, localities. Now, each one of these kind of egg-shaped shells represents um, land value. These are owners of these parcels of land and how much rice they yield. So in other words, this is actually a map about power, about enforcement, about control, because the shogun at that time was trying to control this province. So they needed to understand how wealth was distributed who owns which parcels, how much yield does each particular location uh, produce so that they could seize uh, and control this area. Now, um, what if we were, let me bring back um, this map here. What if we were to georeference this map? So in modern kind of cartographic practice, we typically like to take historical maps and georeference it. So if we were to georeference this map to modern day satellite imagery, this is what would happen to this map. We would completely deform this map and change the whole kind of formality of, of this format into something that we think we can understand. But what if the shogun himself were to come to modern day uh, Japan and take our satellite maps and georeference it to his understanding. What would happen to satellite imagery? Well, that's what would happen to satellite imagery, right? So whose perspective is correct? Are we correct to try to georeference a historical map to our understanding? 
Or should we try to do the opposite and georeference our understanding of modern day maps to theirs? Um, so that's kind of what the ideology behind thick mapping was all about. It's about taking um, a process and kind of thinking through the ideas behind it and why certain practices enforce certain perspectives. Um, but in essence, if I were to describe thick mapping, um, which comes from uh, thick description, and if I were to give it some adjectives, it would be like propositional. It's very temporal, right? It's multi-temporal. It's extensible. It's full of contestation. It's never complete. Um, it's multi-relational, multi-perspectival is another word I like to use, and it's layered. And it's layered not in a sense of modern day kind of GIS where we have you know layers of maps, but we have layers of narratives. So that's what I would say uh, is kind of a quick introduction to thick mapping. Um, I take a lot of my inspiration on thick mapping from other scholars, and this is a, um, a map created by um, Annette Kim from her book, uh, Sidewalk City. Uh, and this is a depiction of the sidewalks in Ho Chi Minh City. And she calls this the ghost map. Uh, and it reflects and illuminates sidewalk spaces because, and they're ghost maps because these sidewalk occupants are typically unseen or unmapped from the general perspective. So who occupies this space? And to this day, one of my favorite thick maps happens to be this one. Uh, and this is one of those like maps that the, the more you look at it, the more thick it gets. There's so much depth in this single map. Um, and it's, I, to this day, I haven't seen another map that, does, that represents a space so effectively. And let me just kind of take you through this. This is just a one block area in Ho Chi Minh City. And it shows a narrative over time. These are sidewalks on each side. And who occupies this space? And when do they occupy it? When do they enter this space? And when do they leave this space? And why, do, why are they there? And what kind of enforcement happens in these spaces? The Z axis here um, represents time. So the lower areas here that are color coded by activity represents early in the morning. So who occupies this space early in the morning? Um, it's occupied by sidewalk cafes, motorbike taxis. But then what happens as the day progresses? Who then takes over this space? Food stands, leisurely activities, and so forth. And this panel on the right represents the actual faces of the people who represented color coded by their activities. So it's really a really fascinating map that um, does a lot of things and depicts many perspectives on a single panel. Um, our work with thick mapping kind of extended to uh, the creation of a platform that we called HyperCities. And HyperCities was um, kind of a a, a three-dimensional mapping platform that prioritized narratives. And one of those, and I'm just going to show you a few of these examples, uh, a PhD student at the time, uh, Zarin Iskandar, she put together a narrative on the mapping of the election protests in Tehran. And, um, you know, it's something that we probably can think of doing today. There's so many troubling events happening around the world. But what this, her project prioritized was her perspective and her understanding of space. And what she did is she took uh, a series of YouTube videos, watched them, uh, all these troubling um, people's, uh, you know, video cams taken from the streets. And she watched them and said, oh, I know where that is. And she started to georeference hundreds and hundreds of YouTube videos, and then weaved to, together a narrative and posted them on HyperCities. And this is kind of the end result of her work. 
was a stream of troubling uh, YouTube videos about what's happening on the ground that wasn't available anywhere else. News outlets were not producing this level of detail and understanding about what was happening on the ground from the perspectives of the people who were involved. Um, uh, I'll, I'll skip a little bit to what I currently do, which is I teach urban data science. And um, I like to prioritize human narratives, even in instructions of mapping and GIS and cartography. So I call it human narratives through code. And, um, you know, students produce amazing maps in just a few weeks. It's a you know, it's a quarter system. UCLA is a quarter system. So I have to teach Python in 10 weeks. Uh, but it's open source. We use a lot of open street map data, which is the people's maps. And you can download um, data with open street maps from anywhere in the world into your computers. And then you can map them, analyze them, create narratives and perspectives. Um, and this is just an example of some of the student work that has come out of my class um, in terms of understanding space. And this is just a snippet of the platform. We use something called Jupyter Notebooks. And Jupyter Notebooks is another kind of modern day coding platform that allows you to weave narratives and code and generate outputs in the same platform. Um, so this is kind of what I currently do in terms of uh, empowering students to use modern day technologies to understand space and time. Um, so that's kind of my first half of my presentation. I wanted to um, talk a little bit about my own work in Fukushima as Ana Maria mentioned and how it has kind of um, evolved over time because the Fukushima accident, if, if you're not, uh, familiar happened in 2011. We're, we're closing in on the anniversary was in March uh, 11. So many of us in the United States understand uh, 911. And in Japan, we have our 311, which is uh, March 11th, uh, 2011, when uh, the tsunami and earthquake happened, and uh, the Fukushima nuclear power plant exploded. So my kind of research revolves around the narratives that percolate from what's called the evacuation zone, uh, which was a 20 kilometer zone enforced by the government and um, enforced people to um, leave their communities. And um, so this image, for example, is one that I took inside the evacuation zone in 2014. Uh, a lot of my research happened in a small town called Namie. And Namie is a, is a village entirely inside this evacuation zone. It's a, about a population of 20,000 people. It's a beautiful coastal town. It bridges um, the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and then it has downtown and then it has mountainous areas. So when we began our research, um, again, we're trying to map something that you can't see, radiation. How dangerous is this space? Um, and I embarked on this project with some scholars. And actually, um, Hugo here, second guy from the right, I met him at Harvard. So actually, this journey of mine began at Harvard University when I visited Harvard in actually 2011 to present some of my work. And he happened to be at my presentation. And we became really good friends. And he invited me to go to Fukushima. And uh, so we. Um, I joined this kind of amazing team. They were called Bishamon. And we would load uh, this kind of multi-directional radiation monitoring device that they invented and load it on the back of the car. And I would load cameras all over the car so that we could record this process and uh, create a kind of an archive, a visual video archive of these spaces that had been entirely abandoned because of a human catastrophe. And um, I'll show you some of the, hopefully this works, some of the images that we took during the time. 
So this is navigating through the coastal zone in 2014. And you can see a lot of the damage um, and, the, and the boats. This is a few kilometers inland. And you can see a lot of the homes in this neighborhood were displaced, dislodged from, um, and the boats from, it's a fisherman's village, so a lot of the boats would come into the land, as you can see, as we traverse the space. And very few homes actually survived. This is one that actually uh, was not dislodged and actually survived the forces of the tsunami wave. So that's the coastal zone and um, about 20 kilometers further inland. Uh, this is the downtown Namie city and I'll show you a little bit about what that looked like. So the effects of the tsunami were not ev evident here, but the effects of the earthquake were evident in this space. Hello. So when this was taken in 2014, it was still entirely abandoned. The city was closed. The government enforced um, curfews. But in this particular city, nobody was allowed to come back. So we took a lot of these images, uh, went back to our lab, stitched them together, um, and put together different kind of like perspectives and facades of, of, of what happened in these coastal and urban spaces. We were also measuring radiation, as I mentioned earlier. And this is where my work as a cartographer came, comes in place. We were measuring millions and millions of data points because when we were traversing these spaces with our vehicles, we are simultaneously capturing image, but we're also measuring radiation. So we have, and we have GPS devices. Combine all that together um, and we can go back to our labs and produce maps. And we did this over a span of multiple years. So collecting millions of data points allows us to assess the levels of radiation that percolate these spaces. And when you put this on a map, then you have temporality because we did this every year. So you can see how neighborhoods changed over time. So this is an image on the left in 2012 when we did our drive-by survey in 2012. And obviously here's the uh, legend here, the red areas represent uh, areas of higher danger and blue green areas represent um, kind of more safe levels. This actual map became a source of a lot of contestation as well, because who is to determine what is green and what is red? And that became a source of a lot of kind of conversations because the government might say, hey, uh, you know, you're, you're coloring this red, but according to our understanding, it should really be green because we think it's safe. The community might think otherwise. They might be like, oh no, any level of radiation isn't safe. So we wanted to keep that red. So as scholars, we were troubled by this difference in opinion. So we created a legend that was actually, um, can you see these handles down here? We, we actually allowed users to move the handles so depending on who you are, what narrative you want to prioritize, you could actually change these greens to red or you could change them to green. Um, so this was one way for us to kind of, uh, you know, remedy these kind of different perspectives that were happening at the time. Um, all that work um, produced, you know, these maps, but it lacked humanity, right? So this is where the urban humanities comes in place. And um, after doing years and years of work, kind of mapping these communities, uh, creating all these radiation maps, I was really troubled because when you actually traverse these spaces, you meet people. 
and you talk to people and you're like, well, their stories, their perspectives aren't represented on these maps. We might see their homes, but we don't know who they are. We don't know if they still live there. We don't know if they decided to abandon this space or decide to come back. So troubled by that, I um, embarked on the PhD program with Ana Maria <laughs> and said, you know what, I'm going to find out what, who lives there and what their perspectives are. And it's maybe something you can only do on a PhD program where you have like multiple years of just losing your mind <laughs> and being able to actually do all this field work. Um, but that's what I embarked to do. And I, based on a lot of the networks that I had created, I befriended a lot of people in Fukushima and people who were involved in this um, catastrophe. And I tried to meet as many people from different walks of life as possible. And for example, Tomoko is a travel inn owner. Uh, she's like family to me now because I keep go going back to Fukushima and stay at her inn. Farmers who, who have been in this space through generations, and I'm talking hundreds of years. Um, in, in Nemoto Koichi's case, 500 year history. So think about the history of the United States as we know it, um, and think about you know, a 500 year farmer's history in a single space. Um, and, uh, you know, senior citizens who had to evacuate, um, spiritual leaders, mayors of, of the cities that also had to evacuate, um, activists, uh, ca the cattle farmer who is an activist now, but also the perspective of um, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, which is the owners of the nuclear power plant. So I was able to meet the vice president of TEPCO at the time and interview him. And um, obviously my favorite is meeting the youth and how they were affected by this. What does it mean to put all these perspectives together? Um, well, when I visited each one of them individually, this is Sueco on the far right. And this is uh, a, um, you know, people displaced citizens were put in these uh, temporary shelters, which were kind of like you know, honestly, they were like containers. And they were forced to live in these spaces for years um, before they were finally able to move out. And this is a lot of university students volunteering their time and coming into these spaces and helping the senior citizens with their mental and physical health. This is Sueco in her container space. And this is her kitchen, tiny. I mean, Japan is tiny to begin with, but make that even more tiny. And we have these kind of uh, shelter spaces. Um, and then sitting down, having tea, talking to them for hours and hours and hours. And then you start to hear the kind of narratives that you wouldn't know of otherwise, the mental anguish, um, the physical toll that living in these spaces have taken over the years. Um, and different perspectives, talking to mayor of the city, this is Sakurai mayor of Minamisoma city, the largest city that was inside the evacuation zone and his perspective on what happened as a, as a leader of his community during the time when he had to physically evacuate people. He had to physically um, put dead bodies in a gym and look after them uh, before uh, the family members came to pick them up. Um, and his perspective about nuclear power and um, their effects on his community, what he thinks about the future and so on. And also being able to go inside the Fukushima nuclear power plant um, and seeing what it, you know, ground zero, what that was like. And these are images that I took um, from inside F1, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And I uh, was also able to interview uh, Ishizaki-san, who is the vice president of TEPCO. And what does he have to say? What, does, what is TEPCO's perspective on what they uh, ended up um, causing to the, all these communities? And it, it's a very kind of perspective that is governed um, by their partnership with um, energy 
and the governance over energy in Japan, which is a country that has no natural resources. So how do they enforce their narrative despite of what happened in Fukushima? Um, and in other perspectives, like the activist who goes all over Tokyo uh, with his little cattle art and um, demands the, uh, the closure of nuclear power plants all over the country, claims that Fukushima is a nuclear colony. Fukushima produces nuclear energy um, for Tokyo. And so, but they don't actually use any of that energy. So Fukushima is a nuclear colony. Um, I know I have two minutes left, so I'll uh, wrap this up pretty soon. But also to finalize with the perspective of the youth. And uh, I know many of you here are probably at the age of um, Chihiro-chan here, who I think she's probably now about 22 years old, but I met her when she was um, 18. And so this happened when she was 13. Um, and, you know, she, this is what she told me um, in Japanese. It's, Ima no de jubun shiawase na no de. Well, now I can move on. My heart is finally at peace. I'm content with my life as it is. And it's just such a poignant and, you know, um, I don't know, the maturity that she had to say that, but also the depth of her words really struck me at the time. Um, and then uh, Sachiko, who is a farmer's wife, <laughs> and uh, in a very kind of Japanese way, she expresses her wrath and anger uh, in a calm demeanor. But essentially uh, what she told me was she wants the next nuclear reactor to, to be built in the middle of Tokyo. Um, and um, as I mentioned, uh, I created a doc documentary film and I showed it all over uh, Fukushima. So these are some of the venues that my film was shown at, but I also showed it at TEPCO. And TEPCO is, again, the electric power company that owns the nuclear power plant that caused this disaster. And I showed it to 100 of their top executives in their Tokyo headquarters. Um, and so that was an amazing experience. Um, but I, I end my talk here by showing you my initial foray into this um, journey, which was creating these kinds of maps um, and ending it with understanding the narratives of the people. This is the electric power company's vice president talking to the uh, inn owner because I invited him to come. And here she is pouring sake to him. It, it's an unreal kind of situation that would not happen otherwise. And here is the mayor of Namia town talking to the activists who have completely opposing ideologies. And yet I was able to capture them talking side by side and having a, a conversation. So um, my message to you to end my talk is to think outside the box, think about maps, not just as maps as we know it today, but maps as narratives. And uh, to think about mapping in terms of uh, discovering the silences and contradictions uh, of what we know maps to be today. So thank you for your time. And uh, sorry, I'm a minute over. <laughs> no, that was amazing, Yo. Thank you so much. Incredible. So I wish we were, you know, together so that we could applaud. It was an incredible presentation. We were going to move on with Danielle's and when she joins with Anastasia's and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. I'm sure that students have lots of questions for you. So Danielle, with that, um, if I can invite you to join us now. Thank you. Thank you very much, and your fantastic job uh, called me as a new fan. <laughs> okay, um, well, um, I want to show you also uh, some of the work we do in uh, Yacta Lab uh, regarding participatory urban planning, uh, mainly, but how we're using technology for uh, engaging uh, people and different stakeholders, um, understanding and planning uh, the environment. First of all, uh, where we are, who we are, uh, we are a research group part of the interdisciplinary department of space and population at University of Cuenca in Ecuador. As uh, Joe was asking before, it's Cuenca, Ecuador is the same name of the city in Cuenca in, in Spain. We are actually kind of a uh, twin uh, cities. So our mission as a research group is to provide scientific evidence to support intermediate cities to face the 21st century challenges. So that's very important in, in Latin 
topic. Okay, so what are those um, challenges? Uh, and I'm always uh, talking about intermediate cities in, in Latin America. We, we did a lot of work on trying to summarize these. Of course, not they are not all, but we think they are the most important. It's urban sprawl, uh, climate change, resource uh, depletion, socioeconomic uh, inequality, health and well-being, and information and knowledge management. So this, as you can see, these challenges are very different from those on the 20th century. But the problem is that uh, sometimes at the universities, we are still teaching urbanism and architecture regarding the 20th century challenges. So that's a very important regarding uh, to our work as academy. But those challenges are crossed by several uh, aspects of the cities, as, you know, like the built environment, the urban morphology, culture, um, urban life, urban services, mobility, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that the, the panorama is quite complex. Uh, and that's why we decided to found the Yaktalab as an interdisciplinary research group. It's impossible to understand uh, cities from a single perspective. And the, traditionally, the city planning process was very, very um, based on, on, on uh, the discipline of urban studies and architecture. But now uh, we need this interdisciplinary uh, approach. So uh, what we do in Yaktalab, it's, I, I can summarize as four parts. We are not covering, of course, all this conceptual mark, uh, map, but uh, this just is actually a map to, 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 to um, understand where our efforts are putting. So uh, first, we study interactions between perceptions, behavior, and urban space with, with a special focus on the interaction between people a, sorry, between a public spaces and sustainable mobility. Probably those are our core expertises. So understanding those interactions as a, a behavioral phenomenon is very important. Second, a, we develop, validate, and adapt tools and methods for urban analysis, including a data collection, processing, integration, analysis, and visualization. So as you can see, we are very data-oriented in, 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 in somehow. Uh, third, we propose and validate, um, validate uh, evidence-based criteria for integral urban design using participatory approaches and co-design principles. And four, we build expertise and capacity for reflexive and critical thinking about the challenges and solutions for urban sustainability in Latin America. So we basically uh, have a, a different a, both graduate and uh, postgraduate programs uh, and also uh, capacity building train and training courses. So that's what we do. But there is some concepts that are very important that define how we do this. So first, we understand the city as a complex adaptive system uh, emerging from the spatial interactions between people and urban environments. So this cha changes a lot of, on, on how Cities are planned, are uh, represented, and are uh, understood. And we borrow this concept of, of the hive mind, uh, that the knowledge is distributed among the individuals, but each individual know only their part of the reality. So when you consider the whole picture, uh, it seems that some kind of emerging order appears. And this is where the patterns are that conform the city. The, the, the video you're seeing there, it's just um, the GPS trajectory of uh, several uh, dozens of cyclists on the city. And when you, you just create an, animate, uh, an animation of this, you can clearly see the patterns of the urban structure of the city. That's what we talk when we are talking about these emergent, uh, emergent properties of the, of the city. So, our challenge is to implement approaches and tools enabling the co-creation of expert local knowledge from and for the cities. So this is a very important challenge, mainly in, in Latin America. We have uh, several projects using uh, those uh, approaches. Uh, I'm just mentioning some of them now, and I will select maybe two or three to, for, for this presentation, but just going over them, uh, scientists in pedals is one, is 
probably our first initiative and in participatory uh, planning and evaluation focus on uh, cycling infrastructure in the city. Uh, before is participatory perception of public spaces and project that's uh, or several projects that we've been working on for the last uh, five or six years. Work and role uh, related, uh, related to accessibility for different mobility profiles. Darwin for a day is a project that we did in Galapagos in collaboration with Google uh, for, for to map uh, Galapagos using this uh, 360 degrees panoramic technology from, from Google and enable, if enabling uh, people to map the biodiversity in Galapagos using these images. Uh, EMAPS is a microscale audit for pedestrian environments. So basically we are uh, trying to understand the, um, the impacts of the urban environment on walkability. Uh, mapping Ecuador is a crop mapping uh, for to support disaster responses. Anna Maria uh, was talking about this uh, project at the beginning at the, at the presentation. IBAM, uh, it's a um, platform for interactive analysis and discussion of gaps in mobility and accessibility. And uh, Kids Just Wanna Have Fun, it's an um, ongoing project uh, when we are including the children in the process of co-designing uh, the, the, um, the routes to, to, to the schools. Okay, so this is just a, a, a very quick overview of all of the parts that we are covering. I'm not going in depth in all of them, but I will just select some of them to show you. And I will put um, uh, some highlights on the methods that we are using for, for them, because I think that's that could be interesting for, for you. So the first one that I want to, uh, to present is uh, EMAPS. So EMAPS is a microscale audit for pedestrian environments, as uh, I told you. And it's a, it was conceived to be a kind of end-to-end -end tool for people who are work, uh, working in walkability and pedestrian environments. So, uh, the idea of this is to understand uh, for a very comprehensive perspective how the micro scale um, uh, features of the urban environment is affecting uh, walkability. So uh, this tool, it's well, it's totally open source and um, includes several uh, what we call subdimensions of the urban environment, as like uh, the facades and uh, buildings, the use and activities on the, the on the sidewalks, the obstacles, intersections, the landscape and, and aesthetics, uh, the sidewalk itself, uh, actually the, the kind of surface, the dimensions, and so. Um, in the the um, the road lanes, uh, the signaling, the shade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So several dimensions that this is, as you can see, very uh, micro scale. So uh, what happens is that um, when we started working on that, we discovered that it was very difficult to compare uh, these features among the streets, and that's uh, where the idea of, of, of this tool came out. So we create this, um, this system that has uh, five components and I will show you very quickly uh, each of, the, of them. Uh, it's based on geographic information systems, specifically uh, QGIS is uh, probably the best open source uh, software for, for, for mapping and GIS analysis. So this, the first part of the first component is an Atlas generator that basically it's very simple to use you can only just draw um, a, a, a polygon of the area that you are going to, to audit or to evaluate. And uh, fully automatically, the software will create a PDF output with an atlas of all the street segments that you need to, to assess. So this is the, what the people will use on the field uh, for the evaluation. And that's actually the second part, the audit protocol it's a validated protocol. It's, uh, we, we run several validation process to, to, um, uh, to ensure the validity and comparability of the, of the results. And it will encompass an auditor handbook. Uh, we have a training and certification process and the, a collection tool that it's, uh, it's meant or it's the, the, the main tool. It's um, um, a form, a digital form that it's loaded in, in mobile phones, it's no, it doesn't require a data plans and so, so it's very easy and, uh, to, to use even if you don't have a, a data connection. But also works on paper, so we have paper-based versions, 
and also online. So sometimes, and this was very important during the pandemics because we couldn't uh, assess uh, the urban landscape, of course, during the pandemic. So we developed also our online version using Google Street View uh, imagery. The third part of the, um, the third component of, of eMaps is the storing and aggregation. So this is based on Cobot Toolbox. It's also an open source platform for uh, field data collection. And uh, this aggregation um, component uh, will take all the data that uh, participants are uh, collecting on the field and that uh, will aggregate in a central server for a first analysis and, and visualization. The fourth part is probably the most interesting because we are here uh, going back to the desktop using a QGIS software and we developed a plugin that will connect to cover toolbox, download all, all the data that was collected and centralized in the, in the the repository and will transform what the participants saw in, in, in the field on what we call a um, walkability scores. So this is just simple synthetic scores that will represent all the benefits or obstacles that are impacting a uh, walkability. So this is a uh, fully customizable, it's very easy to, to use and will produce the the fifth component that is the, the representation and publication of the results. So uh, all this process can be uh, easily implemented in less than uh, a week. Uh, we run several projects based on this uh, uh, tool, also working with um, working with the, with the local government, and uh, we have probably uh, seventy percent of the of the um, streets of the city already assessed using this, uh, this tool. So it's very powerful. And uh, I must insist is everything open source. So you can just download and adapt to uh, the necessities of, the, of each project or, or each uh, region. Uh, the second tool that, uh, that uh, I want to talk is a uh, walk and roll. This is also an access, um, assessment tool, but it's, uh, it's um, focused on comparing not different places only, but also different, what we call mobility profiles. So people without, who can move without any kind of restriction or people who had some kind of impediment for, for walking or for, or for example, some, someone using a, a wheelchair. Uh, this basically is trying to understand what activity different people. So we started using a very qualitative approach. We put some uh, cameras on the helmets and give them to wheelchair uses, uh, users to understand how they map, how they, how they, how they move around the, the, the urban environment. And we start to understand if um, these micro scale elements that we uh, assess using maps are affecting differently to different uh, kind of users, and that, that's that was very clear how uh, they understand how they feel that their accessibility is uh, impact. So uh, our approach was to define these different uh, mobility conditions, uh, create um, a mobile uh, audit tool using the same approach that Emaps, creating a street level assessment um, program. Uh, for all, uh, all, all these um, mobility conditions, so we can create maps and accessibility profiles out of, the, of this uh, data. Uh, as a result, we can also create uh, interactive visualizations. This is a dashboard that is actually uh, publicly uh, accessible uh, for the city. So this is the first assessment of our city in Cuenca, uh, trying to show what's going on with accessibility for for example, people with uh, physical uh, disabilities and, and so on. So it's fully interactive. And this all this data was collected with this participatory procedures uh, for, for uh, wheelchair users. This is a uh, other result. Uh, those are the accessibility profiles for different uh, mobility conditions. Uh, you can see a uh, color coded this, um, this condition. So here in the in the left, uh, in, in red, uh, would be the streets that are highly inaccessible, so are very difficult to access. 
But of course, if you um, uh, have or you use a, a wheelchair, more, uh, more than 80% of the street will be inaccessible. You can compare this with uh, to uh, what, what means uh, inaccessible for people with normal or unrestricted mobility, and you can see that this drops to 30%. So this is creating huge uh, disparities and inequalities on the right to the city in public space. The third uh, project that I mentioned is the first one that we implemented uh, in time. So this project is already 10 years old, and somehow it's still going on. It's scientists on pedals. So uh, what we did here is to create a participatory process inviting um, uh, bicycle users in the city. Um, as you can see here in the, in the picture on the, on the right, um, we create those paper rings and start just to put in, a, in, in the bikes that we found just parked around the city, inviting people to participate in this project uh, under this idea that they are the experts, they are the, the, the researchers because they are, are experimenting and sensing the city um, uh, daily. So um, we were able to rec recruit more than 200 participants uh, over a two years period initially, but some of them are still active, I have to say, and start to create a different uh, experiments and data collection um, techniques and analysis for uh, with them. Okay, so this is the, the web page, the landing web page for the um, for the project where people can uh, just sign uh, up um, as a scientist on pedals. These are some examples that we had, we uh, got out from uh, from out. This is a a lead uh, now for cycling infrastructure. So uh, we just um, um, uh, implemented this uh, again. is a digital uh, form that it's uh, very easy to distribute in mobile phones, and the people start just collecting this data. And this is an example of maps that were out of this uh, of this uh, participatory process. And it was very interesting because um, the results were actually used for planning the new cycling infrastructure in the city. So this is a very uh, straightforward way to involve people in, um, in creating and improving um, the mobility infrastructure in the city. The whole process took uh, around uh, four weeks uh, from the um, recruiting of the participants to the last uh, part where the, the, um, the locations of the cycleways were decided. So it was very interesting to see is actually in, in being put in use. Um, we use also another uh, kind of techniques. Uh, sorry, I think it's not working uh, this video, but uh, in the same uh, as the same example as before, we put just some um, um, sport cameras actually in the helmets of the of the cyclists. The idea was to have not only the video, but also uh, some uh, data that support what is going on in. In, in, the, in the daily trips, how they are interacting with motorized traffic, how, um, how they interact in intersections. Are, are they are not using the cycling infrastructure, for example, that was very interesting to see how even if there are some streets where cycling infrastructures as cycleways or cycle lanes were implemented, they were not using. So we could see that in the video and understand what was happening. So uh, we did an interview uh, after collecting this data to better understand this. So this was easy, uh, this was super useful to aggregate again the data and uh, understand in a whole map what was going on there. Um, more from the digital humanities part, you want. Um, we created this other uh, project uh, that it was called Not All Cyclists Are Created Equal, uh, basically to um, somehow challenge this perception that the cyclists have a very specific profile, meaning uh, male students between 20 and 40 years old and so on. But we discovered that it was uh, very wide range of cycling of uh, bicycle users in the city, actually. And we use a really nice technique that it's called the Q method. I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, because it's a, um, 
quantity qualitative method. It's a kind of mixed method in which uh, you conduct a, conduct a kind of interview with participants and um, create these kinds of pyramids uh, where the participants have to sort is, uh, some uh, sentences at the level of uh, agreement that they have. This is a very common uh, to this point, this, this kind of, of, um, of tool. But the nice thing with a Q method is that you can combine uh, the responses for several uh, participants and uh, using a statistical technique called principal component analysis, extract uh, the predominant point of views about the, about the subject you're, uh, you're researching. In our case, it was the cycling infrastructure of the city. So we were able to detect at least three main perspectives on how the cyclists feel and experiment uh, the urban environment. Uh, we also use uh, some virtual reality uh, prototype for the evaluation of certain alternatives in urban design. So for example, when we were designing um, safe intersections for, for, for cyclists, we wanted to uh, experiment different um, configurations, different colors, different widths, and so. And we uh, created this uh, virtual reality panoramas using very, very cheap technology, I have to say. So you only need a mobile phone, uh, this uh, cardboard uh, virtual reality um, Google is uh, created actually by, by Google. Uh, and we, we we were able to 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 facilitate the process of uh, of uh, of design. So uh, those are the, the the examples that I wanted to show you. Uh, all of our work has been uh, published um, in international journals. There are some just some examples of the projects that I show you and the uh, corresponding reference. Uh, I'm also. Um, putting there our uh, website and the corresponding part of publication where you can access and download uh, the, the publications. Some very important thing for us, all our work is based on open source and open data. So all the tools that I uh, presented on uh, other ones, you can uh, access them, download, implement, modify, do wherever you want. <laughs> We are actually, we are uh, firm believers in open science. Uh, science uh, so all of our tools are uh, available for free. No subscription, no request needed. You only go to our website and you can access directly to them, including the data sets. So it's not just the tool, but you can actually replicate any one of our projects or our publications using the tools and the data sets that are publicly publicly uh, available there. So it's the, just a kind of last or final um, reflection. Uh, when we create a collaborative map, we are putting together our collective experience. It's not just the, the individual experience, but the collective experience. And we're discovering patterns and, re and reaching a joint understanding on the causes of such collective experience. And that's what we call public space. It's a collective experience. It's not just a place. It's not just a, a dimension. It's a collective experience. Thank you very, very much for the invitation, Anna, and um, I will be ready for the Q&A at the end. No, thank you, Daniel. It's amazing the work that you're doing at the Jagdalaf. It's incredible. I mean, I call Cuenca the Uruguay of Ecuador because you just cannot believe that a city like that exists in Latin America. And it's because it has incredible people. Thank you so much, Daniel. And I see that Anastasia already joined us. So I wanted to welcome you, Anastasia, for being here with us. I introduced you at the beginning, but just in case someone was not uh, around. When I did, in a nutshell, Anastasia right now is basically the Dean at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs, which is wonderful and a distinguished professor of urban planning. And uh, most importantly for the discussion we're having today, she's one of the co-founders and, uh, and core professors at the UCLA Urban Humanities Initiative. So Anastasia, eh, I can't see you. Let me put this on the matrix. Do, 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 do. I think we'll, we saw- Anna, oh, you, can you- 
I'm here. Can you, uh, can I share my screen? You should can be able to. Co-host or I, I should be able to? You yeah, give it a shot if you can. I want to say I'm very happy to see you and Yo from Tokyo because uh, you know, we go back for many, many years and it's always great to see you, even though Yo is in Tokyo, you're in uh, Boston, I'm in Los Angeles, but it's with uh, Zoom, these distances disappear. So, so that's great. Let me try to share my screen. I think. Fabulous. Uh, can you see it? Yes, we can see it perfectly well. Okay. Uh, and let me also play slideshow, play from start, or here we go. Okay, so um, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions, although I do know that there are going to be also questions in the end, but I'm going to introduce you to what we call urban humanities, that uh, we, it was a privilege to have both Yo and Ana Maria taking part in, in, in this program. And we are this year in the not ending the ninth or tenth year of the program, and it already has about 160 um, graduates, and the graduates are doing great things. So we are pretty happy about that. But let me tell you what it involves. Um, it is first and foremost an experimental field, uh, and it is an academic initiative. Uh, it uh, started actually as an RFP from the Mellon Foundation that invited a few universities around the country to submit proposals. Uh, and we submitted a proposal with Dana Kaff and Todd Pressner, Maite Zubiaur and myself are the four core faculty. And we were very interested in studying the urban but using experimental methods and methods that are very interdisciplinary and new and come from different fields. Each one of us came from, from a different field. My background is in urban planning and architecture. Dana is in architecture. Uh, Maite Zubiaire and uh, Todd Pressner are in humanities coming from different fields. So we wanted to bridge some of these fields in, in and finding new ways to understand the urban, but also intervene into the urban settings. And this is not something, inter this intervention is not something that the classical field of humanities is accustomed to, while the fields of urban planning and architecture, of course, want to intervene in, in the urban form and propose ideas and uh, responses. So this urban humanities discipline or subdiscipline, whatever you may want to call it, is at the intersection of humanistic, social science, uh, urban studies and design studies. And we also have a tremendous respect for history. So we, these investigations draw from the past in order to analyze the future and to make proposals for these interventions, for these the future of urban settings. And this is also a field that really looks forward towards action-oriented research for these various interventions in the city. And I will show you a number of examples so that you get a better idea of, of what I mean. Um, I, but I want to start from with a quote from a book that was published in 2015 by Kenny and Majin that is called Cities Beyond Borders, Comparative and Transnational Approaches uh, to Urbanism. And what they say is that much of urban history research has sought to pair or categorize cities on the basis of complementarity of existing source material, but this categorization should be disrupted by a creative use of sources and increasing inclination to fuse different sources and the adoption of original methods emerging from different interdisciplinary scholarship. And this is something that very much we believe in in urban humanities. We really are interested in this fusion of different disciplines and a methodological experimentation because we believe that 
the urban is very complex to be studied only by, by one discipline. And actually, if we go back, oops, sorry. And we look into um, studies of cities. We have studies of cities from very early on. You know, I'm originally from Greece and Pausanias, um, in Greek is called Pausanias, uh, wrote as he was traveling ab about cities and created an urban biography of cities. Then we have in the 19th century, a number of these urban biographies, Charles Baudelaire, he wrote, short essays and poems about Paris. Um, we have um, um, uh, um, the Flan uh, we have the Flaner um, kind of blanking on on the name of starts with B and I'm blanking on the name of the, the third book in the in uh, the road. Someone help me here. You know who I'm talking Benjamin. about oh, Maria Walter, Walter Benjamin. Benjamin. Walter Benjamin, exactly. He wrote very eloquently about, about Paris. Uh, much later, John Steinbeck, he was not an urban historian, of course, but he wrote this very well-known Canary Road and talks about Monterey Park. So we have these urban biographies of cities that discuss their everyday situations, sometimes their architecture, sometimes their social relations. But these um, single case studies in the 1970s came under attack uh, because of their single site focus. Uh, they were often considered as unsatisfying, as parochial, as ethnocentric. Um, and as it was written, the day of the individually posed idiosyncratic study of a town that has no particular analytical purpose is now on the wane. And that was in the 1970s we start seeing um, comparative studies of, of cities uh, and comparative and interest in comparative urbanism, which really identifies and compares two different socio-spatial contexts and how they may be influenced on one another. So for example, Susan Feinstein's book, The City Builders focuses on New York and London. Um, we have uh, Savage uh, writing the post-industrial cities that focuses again on New York, London, and Paris and compares these cities. Um, we have other books that really try to present this comparative urbanism, and I'm kind of listing a few. There are a ton of these different books. Um, very recently, my colleague, uh, Michael Storper, with a number of his uh, doctoral students, compared, for example, Los Angeles and San Francisco, the rise and fall of urban economies. So this comparative urbanism is very useful in understanding these cities. Uh, it presents urban imaginaries as sites of encounters with other cities, mediated through travel, sometimes through migration flows, the circulation of images, of goods, of ideas. These books and studies tend to identify similarities and differences of at least two cities, sometimes more, and use the city or the nation state as a unit of analysis. One source of criticism comes from the fact that a lot of these books tend to concentrate on Western cities or cities of, of the global North. I mean, you know, the big cities, the global cities, the cities of the global north, and very little uh, has been written in terms of comparative urbanism for the global south. Oops. Why am I, my, wait a minute, why this is not going? Okay. So this comparative urbanism has been questioned recently as overly constrained by fixed entities and arbitrary divisions, such as municipal or national boundaries. And the critics counter that urban networks and influences are dynamic, are diverse, and transcend such boundaries. And also there is the danger of when we are doing these comparisons of homogenizing differences 
and disregarding some local particularities in favor of extracting universal lessons to urban issues and problems. And there is also the post-colonial critique against comparative urbanism that, as Robinson put it, it universalizes Western accounts of cities, which is inappropriate. On his side, Edward Said uh, criticized these types of comparative urbanism, especially uh, when it reflected some of the um, Asian cities or the cities of the global South as culturally inaccurate, even exoticized representations and understandings of non-Western cities, which are inappropriate. I'm not sure why I'm not, oh, here we go. Okay. And so as a result of these um, critiques, we see the rise of transnationalism, urbanism, and urbanist studies, which really focuses on interdependencies, on movements, on flows across borders in different regions and sub-regions. And it tries to understand urban settings and experiences of these in these settings as composed by multiple regional, ethnic, institutional identities and forces. And it also emphasizes the human connections and the social and special impacts of these connections. And it's very interested on issues such as immigration, border crossings, political refugees, economic exchanges, influences that are multicultural sometimes in the arts and hybrid urban landscapes. And so I'm kind of listing a number of books on transnational urbanism from beyond cities and borders uh, to Anania Royce and Ezar El Sayad's Urban Informality to Transnational Urbanism by Michael Peter Smith, Transnational Migration, Worlding Cities, an ed edited book by Anania Roy and Aihua Ong. And so urban humanities is very much inspired and positions itself within this transnational urbanism and draws from this transnational urbanism to study the urban, to consider these what we call interweavings and intimacies and conflicts and collectivities and engagement among different people and their settings, their social spatial context. And we believe that this helps us to better understand past and presently linked practices between different settings and their cultures to comprehend complex issues in the past in relation to the present. And we need this knowledge in order to intervene and propose a potential future. Um, we also draw a lot on spatial ethnography, and I will say a few things a little bit later to contrast and compare the micro settings of everyday life. So urban humanities is particularly interested in the micro settings of everyday life. We favor engaged scholarship with critically framed questions and understandings of the connectivity and influences among urban places. Uh, we fuse different data sources and methodologies and we actually prefer to not call method the methodologies, but rather the practices of urban humanities, which as I will explain later, draw from what we call filmic sensing, thick mapping, spatial and social ethnography, and public arts interventions. And we want to encompass what we call a projective imperative, which is the obligation of urban scholarship to open up possibilities and envision alternatives and better futures. And as I mentioned, the object is the spaces of everyday life, uh, the focus of the micro spaces under a humanistic lens that documents social interactions, cultural expressions, multiple layers of history, as these spaces are appropriated by different groups in the city a street corner, a city square, a park, a bus stop. These are the micro settings of everyday life that do not get much attention often from policymakers or architects or even planners, 
who focus usually their attention on the prime spaces of a city. And yet these are the cities that most of everyday life is spent. Another value of the urban humanities is a focus on spatial justice. We use sp spatial justice as a lens to identify disparities and inequalities in neighborhoods because of the unequal distribution of urban amenities the unequal distribution of parks, of trees, of supermarkets, of medical clinics. Of course, my former colleague, late Ed Soja, who was one of the very first to talk about spatial justice. But on the right, you see a project by Kelly Hernandez. He's a professor of history at UCLA and one of the uh, um, a recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship, the Genius Fellowships, and she is also affiliated with Urban Humanities. And she created this project that she calls the Million Dollar Hoods, where uh, she looks into metropolitan Los Angeles and identifies an, a few census tracts where the cost of incineration of their residents exceeds $1 million. And as you can imagine, these um, census tracts that have these high levels of incineration, and a lot of them, a big numbers of incineration are of unhoused individuals that are being, um, that, that the police takes them and puts them into jail till, you know, they may come out in a day or two, but uh, all these are creating these census tracts that are primarily the minority and low income census tracts in the city that Kelly identifies as the million dollar uh, hoods. These census tracts also coincide with the places in the city where uh, we have the presence of disamenities, air pollution, noise, impacts on health and quality of living. So just to repeat, the values of urban humanities are the spaces of everyday life and spatial justice for these spaces. And we believe that we need to pursue this spatial justice through engaged scholarship and pedagogy and through initiation of a series of university community collaborations with many of these uh, affected communities. The practices or methods of urban humanities are experimental. They aim not only at collection of data, but also at intervening in the urban landscape. They draw from different media to understand how different groups perceive, move, and appropriate spaces in the cities, and they are collaborative. Students work in group, faculty work in groups. Urban humanities wants to disrupt, to disrupt the fragmentation of the silos of the different research fields and the research traditions through the collaboration of different disciplines. Um, the action is in situ. I mean, we really do field work in different urban settings. We have a particular focus in cities of the Pacific Rim. And we have taken classes to Tokyo, Shanghai, Mexico City, in Mexico City multiple times. Uh, and of course, our own laboratory, different settings of Los Angeles. We believe in thickness. What we mean by that is the multiple layers of data about the urban form coming from different literature, from, from different disciplines, from the literature, from historic texts, historical texts, oral histories, community arm, art, sorry, film, social media, but also print media, newspapers, field observations, and empirical evidence. And the purpose is to construct knowledge. There is a lot of work in the studio, which is something that architects are, of course, very familiar with, but not necessarily people who come from the humanities. Uh, there is a lot of work in actual city spaces, but also maps, models, film, text, and art installations. Um, we believe in open source knowledge that is easily accessible. Um, distributes research beyond the confines of the ivory tower through websites, podcasts, podcasts, installations, and presentations. And we like to speculate for the future, to offer scenarios and proposals, 
for neighborhoods and cities based on both historic and contemporary data and cultural and contextual specificities. Uh, the, in the middle, maybe I think Ana Maria would, I don't know if that was your project, Ana Maria, but I remember you were in the Tokyo year, right? Yes, I was in the Tokyo year, it was fabulous. So the methods or practices of urban humanities is thick mapping, which draws from critical cartography, uh, imbued with histories, ways of seeing, knowing, and controlling. And a thick map is a map that has multiple layers of information that comes from people's different readings of the urban and from multiple voices. So a thick map, it's not only one person creating the thick map, but a multiplicity of people that add information to the map. It contains different data in ways that they compose a larger whole and often reveal some hidden um, relationships. I mentioned earlier that another method of urban humanities is, is spatial ethnography. We drew uh, information, for example, from Annette Kim's work and book, Sidewalk City, where she really did a spatial ethnography of street vendors in, in Vietnam and their moves through the city during a day of work. Um, spatial ethno ethnography is based on observing um, urban life, analyzing and documenting sociocultural and political activities that happen in specific places during a specific time. And it combines design analysis, anthropological and ethnographic observation and human narrative. Uh, it's based also on interviews, oral history, focus groups about the spaces of everyday lives in cities. Filmic sensing and the, you see uh, Yoka Wano's project on Fukushima. Uh, Yo really used brilliantly the video camera uh, to document the socio-spatial settings of, of Fukushima. He probably, I, I'm sorry, I missed your presentation, Yo, because I was in meeting still five minutes till I joined, but he has created a brilliant film on, on Fukushima and talked to some of the protagonists um, and kind of brought the voices, their voices up front in this uh, human and spatial tra tragedy that is called Fukushima. Uh, so this filmic sensing uses a video camera or even the camera through the smartphone that becomes then a tool for sensing the city. Um, Anne Spurn in The Eye is a Door has written that a photograph can be used not only as art, but also as a practice of finding about spaces. Looking through the camera lens and taking pictures helps not only to see the world, but also to sense and understand it. And we also employ what we call digital storytelling, storytelling from different community storytellers, production of digital narratives and short films focused on the issues that storytellers consider important to make a particular phenomenon such as displacement, deportation visible, and Yo used that in his work. And it also incorporates different perspectives and different profiles of the storytellers. So the way that we integrate this in uh, the curriculum at UCLA, we uh, have 24 graduate students every year that come from architecture, urban planning, humanities, and the social sciences. We particularly focus, as I mentioned, on the urban cities of the Pacific Rim. Um, and these are from some of the field work. This is from Mexico City, uh, creating play spaces in Mexico City in the Doctores neighborhood. Uh, and this is again from the events that happened in the neighborhood that brought the kids in an environment that was primarily occupied by the car and in another uh, pedestrian unfriendly environment, how do you occupy the streets and the sidewalks to create a play space? This was you know, the, the project and everybody had great fun, but more importantly, there were certain uh, policy recommendations that were picked up by Laboratorio, which was a group working with uh, the mayor in Mexico City 
to institutionalize some of these spaces. This is another project from students about the cyclists of Boyle Heights. Boyle Heights is a Latino neighborhood at the edges of downtown. Um, and a number of people do not own cars and they use the bicycles, but it has very high numbers of injuries and fatalities because people are overrun by, by the car. So the students decided to, after interviewing and learning about the routes and the issues that a number of these cyclists are facing, um, were inspired by the work of Ramiro Gomez, who, you, you can see who you can see his no splash that kind of takes David Hockney's a bigger slash splash uh, work and inst instills the the person who cleans the pool who is usually uh, a non-white person and in this kind of uh, ideal landscape landscape of uh, a wealthy person's pool. Uh, Gomez brings our attention to the manual lab labor of the, the worker who has to clean the pool or to the gardener uh, who, who mows the lawn. And so what the students did inspired by some of Ramiro Gomez's work was to create um, these carton cut projects of cyclists and install them. There was an installation involved, install them in areas that had high crash rates to bring attention to the plight of some of these cyclists. Uh, another project was called Seeking Literary and Spatial Justice for Children in Boiler Heights. And it, the students created a box. You see uh, a student sitting on the box that actually can be transferred to part of the park and it, it opens uh, it reveals a number of books and an event where books are read to children um, happens at the park. And this is more about what is called the mag magic box uh, and how you know it, it is transported and how it attracts the attention of the kids. And this was another project. Uh, that relied a lot on identifying that there were not, you know, public libraries uh, available, that children love to be uh, read uh, children's stories, that one could combine this uh, with a kind of a nearby park. Uh, this is a, another project on intergenerational spaces in, in Westlake. This is another neighborhood, low-income immigrant neighborhood at the edges of downtowns, and it has a number of older adults too. And again, uh, they are quite threatened by um, the cars and the traffic. Uh, we did a number of walking and audits. Uh, walking with these older adults and some of their most stressful moments are in the when they are in the middle of the arterial and the light turns red and people start honking. And um, a, a group of uh, students of mine that they call themselves PhD students of mine that they call themselves the Uncommon Public Space Group helped create a intergenerational event at one little park, the Golden Age Park, that some other students of mine and myself have helped create in this neighborhood. Uh, the park opened in the November, 2019. It's the first park in Los Angeles that is older adult friendly, but COVID happened and the park had to close. And so when we kind of exited out of COVID, uh, the Uncommon Public Space created an intergenerational uh, festival at the park with, oop, I don't, I should have put more pictures, with tamales and food, with a Shakespeare uh, performance by people in the neighborhood and by a, an orchestra from the neighborhood, from kids in the neighborhood and older adults. And it attracted hundreds of people that came uh, to, to enjoy the park and spend time with one another. So in conclusion, 
the urban humanities attempts to sidestep the pitfalls of essentialism, homogenization, and erasure of difference between cities, and employs engaged scholarship and community input and action to mold its proposals, deploys a range of thick methods to understand and create possibilities for everyday metropolitan life, links cities through practices that rely on extended engagements, seeking an understanding through the shared actions of scholars and citizens, and rather than finite solutions, urban humanities projects are public propositions that will evolve through iterations leading to more permanent change. And this is the book about urban humanities that uh, Dana Kaff, Todd Pressner, Maite Zubiaure, Jonathan Christman, who was a uh, director of urban humanities and now he's assistant professor at the University of Arizona and myself, wrote, it was published by MIT Press in 2020, and explains in more detail what I try to summarize in these uh, 30 minutes. And so that's the end of my presentation. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Thank you. Thanks, the three of you. You missed the Daniel and yours uh, presentations. They were wonderful as well. But I feel um, that the three of them yeah. come together beautifully. If I can, I mean, and sorry, I'm going to be here a little bit selfish because I'm thinking about very specific students, but if I could sort of like draw from each one of you a, I think, incredible ideas that may really help us in, in Shushufindi is um, from you, your, and I know this was the before the humanities component, but Shushufindi is a highly contaminated area with oil. And I think that actually your greed with your colors from green to red may be a very useful methodology for us to maybe sample the soil in different areas of Shushufindi. Because one of our students, Jocelyn, is very interested in bioremediation, but she's also interested in somehow measuring the degree of contamination of Shushufindi. So I'm feeling that maybe we all deploy, you know, mutual forces to try to sample as much as possible in uh, the site and try to get a sense of how contaminated the soil, the water uh, and the air are through different devices that we could use to measure these. So thank you so much for that idea. And of course, uh, bringing in also the lives of the people who are suffering from these incredibly high risk zone that we're going to be facing soon. So I like the idea of complementing it with the type of spatial ethnographies and the micro scale that Anastasia has described and Daniel has described also through the work they're doing with, uh, and we all agree on open source, the work they're doing with EMAPs. And I guess that the three of you have also inspired the idea that since we're putting a publication together and we've been thinking it more as a printed object, that it would be fabulous to really combine it through QR with multimedia approaches because spatial ethnography calls for a multimedia approach. We need recordings, a video, the, the film sensing is a great strategy. Th thank you for reminding me, Anastasia, about how useful film sensing was. Uh, and maybe we can do an exercise of film sensing at Chuchufindi, which um, I'm trying, I'm wondering about, uh, you know, smells, how, would, how could we bring smells into place? Because it's so contaminated that in Chuchufindi, you continuously feel the city in your nose and not very many cities are so much in the nose like Shushufindi and you really feel dizzy and you feel sick and, and, and you just want to leave this place you know it's very so I'm wondering how do we bring all the senses through this multimedia approach that the three of you have shared with us and also multi-scalar from the large scale but nevertheless thick mappable um a, to the micro scale of the bike or the pedestrian um, and you know the, the, the spatial ethnography. But I think that this has been very, very, very rich in terms of just offering potential, potential uh, ways of uh, documenting, mapping and describing and analyzing collectively, of course, the city for, for the students in my studio, in Catholic studio, and I hope uh, elsewhere. But I guess that I would love to hear from you guys if you have any questions. And Esteban Jaramillo is here as well. He has just joined his students at Catolica in Ecuador, so we can't really see them. 
but um, but through Esteban, I'm sure that many are listening to us as well. Any questions coming from you guys or comments? Uh, hi, I have a question for uh, Joe. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's more about the political context of Japan. I was wondering, like, how would you say, like, how effective would you say to quantify your narrative in terms of like the decision making process of politics? Like, how how is data playing the part for designers to participate in that process in Japan? Yeah, thank you. Uh, is it how how Zoo? Is that right? Yes. Yes. Thanks for the question. Um, that's a good question. How do you how do you quantify qualitative data? Is actually always a researcher's dilemma, right? Qualitative data is always very difficult to quantify. Um, I think my work in terms of the ethno ethnographic component has produced a film, which has a different way of engaging the public than traditional research may have. My initial foray was building all those maps of the amounts of radiation that were present in the spaces that were contaminated. That work was shared with local governments. So we had a commitment to measure radiation through scientific methods. And we had a contractual agreement, a partnership with the local governments to publicize this data. So our agreement was to measure, to collect, to analyze, to create visual representations of these spaces, and then to publish. That publication was um, channeled through the government websites. So our data was made available to the public. That enables the public to make informed decisions because they can see their own communities layered with scientific data about how the governance will make decisions on whether or not these spaces continue to be abandoned or not. So it's a very kind of powerful top-down approach to governance of these spaces, right? It's kind of like that map that I showed you in the very beginning about the shogunate, how they use maps to kind of control um, spaces. And so that led to the second part of my talk, which was the ethnography, which brings the voices of the people and their perspectives about, you know, the data that we collected and how it affects their daily lives. I don't know if I have a good answer to your question about how that can be quantified in any way, other than it's a source of kind of um, community healing the one thing that I took from the community was that they wanted their voices to be heard. So they were very engaged in during my interviews because I told them my intent of it was to publicly uh, publish their voices to the world. So I think in, in that sense, it, it has a huge measure. Can't quantify it in any way, but it, it has a different way of, of, uh, of, of kind of publishing their voices that aren't heard Otherwise, so we're talking a lot about these unheard spaces, unheard people, unseen voices. So that's just one way of doing that. Great. Um, okay, you. I think Rachaya has a question up there. Rachaya. Hi. Um, yeah, I like, I, first of all, thank you for uh, all the, the speakers. But I probably I, I still want to ask um to continue the question for you, um, but more or less the technical stuff, but uh, specifically the case for Fukushima, because uh, I I I really remember the the incident and it was very moving hearing your your research. Uh, to link that directly to Chuchu Findi, because as I was looking at the oil infrastructures and uh, the refineries and the um, platforms in in the middle of the city. It is also uh, like the same kind of risk, uh, the buffer that it has uh, with the people who are sitting there. 
So uh, we also thought about like uh, evacuation plans or uh, risk mitigation or moving people, um, which which I, I recall that from the case in uh, Nam Ye. Uh, I, and, and, and I feel like there's a dilemma because the maps, um, the, the information like really suggests that like very directly, like you could see it's red. And, but then I, I was fascinated when you talk about like when different people uh, have different perspectives of what is, um, what is contaminated as much for them. And then it comes to the decision whether they they want to stay, but but it's contaminated, or do they not want to stay? I, I think this is kind of the it, it comes down to the ground that like at, even if the the data suggests that very clearly, we don't react directly to that um, because of the attachments we have. So I wonder how how it it resolved or the conversation led to. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? How a map can bring about different perspectives. And, um, you know, the Atomic Agency had a different kind of threshold as the Japanese government had a different threshold. The community had a different threshold, the farmers. And the farmers would have different thresholds depending on what their narrative is, right? They wanted to be green because they want to sell their produce, yet they want it to be red so the world knows that they live in these contaminated areas. They are conflicted with how to color their own neighborhoods. It, it's just, um, there is no easy answer to that. And that's why this practice um, of thick mapping, um, disrupting the narrative is really important because those maps are not meant to be static. They're, they're living narratives that change depending on the perspective, de depending on the time, depending on the season. So um, that's why we we made efforts to modify or make those maps dynamic and interactive in ways that can um, allow different perspectives to, to, to live. But I know it's super late and you will, not for Anastasia as much, but for everyone else, I feel, and you probably want to have some dinner and and take some rest. So thank you all. Thank, special thanks to Anastasia and Danielle, Yo, who's not here for these incredible, incredible presentations. Well, and, thank uh, you for inviting us. Good luck with the, with the work. Thank you so much. Take care. Ciao, ciao. Gracias. Ciao. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.